Ready for the word? Cool. So I want to talk about living above the fear of death. And this is a little bit of a continuation, sort of a, on, on last Sunday, you know, uh, Danny and Marcy brought a good word. I, I just shared a few thoughts briefly, uh, but I kind of want to do just explore a little bit more on a couple of those thoughts that, uh, because that was Resurrection Day. We're celebrating that Jesus beat death. How cool is that? I mean, he beat death. That's not, that, you know, like nobody else got to do that, right? Nobody else beat death. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, that's even better than beating taxes, right? It's like, it's a really big deal. Right? So he made the way for us. He pioneered it. He opened the door. He beat death. And, and if, we, if you love Jesus, you follow Jesus, you beat death also, right? You're redeemed from it. You're rescued from this thing. It's an enemy. A few weeks back, we were talking about the creation zone, right, for uh, several weeks, actually. And I'm not even done with that. I'm going to go back to that. But we talked about the creation zone. God didn't create things to die. He didn't create mankind to die. He didn't create animals, plants, living things to die. It wasn't his plan. God is not the author of death. He's just the author of life, and everything was created to live. The Bible says that death came because of Adam's, Adam's sin, Adam and Eve, really, you know, but it came because of the sin of man, and that caused separation, and separation caused death, and that also caused Satan to get a grip on the human race and have some legal authority over the human race, right? And so all of that produced death, and death is an enemy. We all know that, don't we? In the world, the thinking of the world, you know, if you're just raised it without really the biblical uh, knowledge, biblical under understanding, you were raised with the idea that, you know, there's just this cycle and millions 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 of years of things live and die and 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 get more complicated as they go, which doesn't really work. Uh, but uh, that's not even true. Bible worldview is that God created things to live and death was an enemy that got into the world. And he hates that enemy. He hates what it does. And he is going to destroy it and redeem us from it. In fact, he did it on the cross, right? And ultimately, we'll see, we'll see the fullness of that when the trumpet blows, Jesus comes back, and we get resurrection bodies, and we live forever and ever and ever. And, and I, and I want to talk a little bit more about that concept because it's so empowering to know that Jesus beat death. You know, a lot of the, the Christian concept, again, that people have is maybe, you know, gotten more from cartoons than from the Bible. You die, you go to heaven, you sit on a cloud, you play a harp for a, like a really long time, right? What's that about? That's not, that's not the real picture, is it? Okay? We're going to live forever in these, well, it'll be a new body, but you'll be you. You'll be you forever and ever and ever, right? And Jesus rose from the dead at about 33 years old, right? That's a young adult, right? 33-year-old person looks pretty good still, huh? <laughs> they look just fine, right? And so my understanding is we're going to be, you know, raised in the image of Jesus. So we're going to be, we're going to be young adults forever. We're going to be us. You're going to look like you, only younger and better, right? Or for some of you, maybe a little older. I don't know, you know, <laughs> but... but you know, that's the idea, is we're going to be eternal life. You'll be who you are. Right? We're redeemed from death. That thing is not a threat to you anymore. Really, it's not something that, you know, you have to live in fear of. Uh, let's, let's go into the, the scriptures, and let me unpack this a little bit more. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. I believe it's Paul writing, even though he didn't sign it. But he said, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. What does that mean? The children is us, the children of, you know, children of, of the world, of Adam and Eve, the human race, and we partake in a flesh and blood. We have flesh and blood bodies. It says, so he, Jesus, likewise shared in the same. He took on a flesh and blood body like us, became one of us, and he did it with a reason and a purpose. And part of that reason, it says here, is that so that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. That's really good news. Destroy the devil, destroy the power of death, and set us free from it. Really good news, right? Not just that endless cycle of things live and die, live and die, but eternal life, right? Delivered from death. So awesome. Jesus came. Part of what Jesus did was a military attack against the devil. It was a militant, right? I'm going to come destroy. It was a torpedo attack on Satan. I'm going to destroy you and the power of death. And anybody who follows me gets out of it. Amen? Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, how did he do that? Well, you know, the Bible says that death came because of man, right? Man's sin. And, and then God became a man. The second person of the Trinity became a man called Jesus, flesh and blood like us. And he took onto himself our sins, right? The punishment for our sins. But he also took, the Bible says that the penalty for sin is death. 
and he took our death onto himself. He died, right, for us, for you and me, not only redeeming us from sin, but he redeemed us from death, right, forever and ever. Uh, beat the thing. Uh, oh, there was something else I was going to say with that, but it escaped me. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So how did he destroy the devil with that? How did, how did that happen? So here's, here's the deal. When Satan, you know, when mankind sinned, Satan kind of got the power of slavery and death over the human race, right? And by, when, he, when Satan kills people, he's not really, I mean, he kind of has the authority to do it, you know, because we sinned. He, you know, tempted us to sin. We sinned. Adam and Eve did it, you know. And, uh, and so he kind of has the authority to do it. But with Jesus, he went a step way too far, and he killed an innocent man. And, <laughs> Yeah, and he became a cosmic criminal sentenced to his own condemnation, right? For that, he was absolutely destroyed by doing that because Jesus, he had no authority over Jesus. Jesus did not sin. He was an innocent man, and, and he volunteered himself in that position to die for us, right? And Satan took the bait and killed an innocent man, and he was just, he's condemned. And he's going to face the lake of fire soon for that. He's already defeated. He's already, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good news, isn't it? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Yeah. And then it says that Jesus did that to release us from death, from the power of death, but he also did it to release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And this is kind of the heart of what I want to talk about today a little bit, is that one, just, almost as important as releasing us from death is the fact that Jesus releases us from the fear of death. And that's very empowering because... Uh, you know, death is an enemy. Everybody instinctively fears it and hates it, right? And people who don't know Jesus, they should fear it. They quite honestly should fear it. But if you know Jesus, you don't need to fear death, right? But I know from years of pastoring that most Christians really are afraid of death, right? Really are. You know, and I know that myself. I've, you know, when, when, you, when you have, a, you know, some sickness or attack on your body and, you know, and like you feel like, wow, I could die from this, Right? There's a fear that comes, isn't there? There really is. And, and you know, I've had that before, and I, and I know what to do with it. You know, don't embrace it. Don't feed into it. You know, reject it in the name of Jesus because I'm going to live forever. I know this, right? I know what the Bible says. You know, but that, but that fear is real, right? All right, anybody else ever felt that at all? Okay, of course. You know, you get, you know, get sick, and you can't breathe as easy, and it's like, I could die, right? So God wants to set us free from the fear of death. Amen? And, and this, is, this is very empowering because I, I know, and you probably know too, that a whole lot of people spend their whole life just trying not to die. People live their life just trying not to die. And that's not the, the life that God meant for you to live, right? That's, that's not, living our life trying, just trying not to die is living as a shadow of really what we were intended to be. We're intended to live for Jesus, right? Just purposely and with, with fullness, with in, fully engaged, right? Live, with, live for Jesus, loving him, making him known, being a light, being an influence, being a leader, right? Being a, a changer, a transformer of the world around us. That's what we're meant to live as. If we're just living trying not to die, really, we've lost our purpose, right? We're a shadow of what we were intended to be. We're intended to live very noble lives. Okay? So, you know, and I'm not talking about being careless, play in traffic and go, ha, 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 you know. I'm not talking about that. You know, I want to live my full life too, right? I don't want to die early. I don't want to die, you know, in a dumb way. But, but I'm not going to live in fear of death. I'm going to live forcefully. I'm going to live purposely. I'm going to live with, for Jesus. Amen? Fully engaged. Amen? Yeah. Uh, so he wants to release us from that. We, I mean, that's big business, right? If you watch, you know, any commercials or any media, you know, somebody can come up with, you know, they'll sell you, what is it? Oh, we found a, you know, a rare berry in a secret forest in Japan, and we've crushed it and bottled it. And if you, you know, give us $500 for this bottle of this secret berry, you'll live longer. And people go, where do I send the check? You know, <laughs> and it's a lie. You know, it's a bunch of baloney. But people are afraid of death. Okay? We don't have to be. We can live fully engaged, fully engaged. And when I cross, I cross, right? Uh, let's, let's keep going here. Um, Mark 8, 34 and 35. So earlier on, Jesus uh, said to his uh, disciples and the people around him, he, said, he called the people to himself 
with his disciples also, and he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What, is, what, what, what was that about? Of course, they don't know that Jesus has an appointment with a cross. They don't know that's coming. But the people in that culture do know that the Roman government would execute criminals on a cross. And if you see somebody carrying their cross, they're on their way to die. <laughs> they have an appointment with death today, and it's hours away. And so Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, which means you're gonna die. if you follow me, I want you to die to self. I want you to die to selfishness and pride and ego and stubbornness and self-will and, you know, my way or the highway and blah, blah, blah. He wants you to die to all of that. I want you to give me your life. And Jesus is calling disciples here. He's not necessarily talking about salvation at this point. Later on, he said, right, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He said, preach the gospel. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved say but he's calling disciples and he needs radical disciples he needs people that'll give their life he needs to change the world right and so he needs disciples who will give it all right? and he's calling those people out go ahead and whoever desires to save his life will lose it whoever loses it for my sake and the gospels will save it and you can take this on different levels you know if, if you live, desire to save your life you lose it that's kind of what I said earlier if you just spend your life trying not to die You've lost your purpose, for starters, right? You've lost the noble person you were created to be and the influential person you were created to be, for starters, right? Uh, and if you try to save your life so much that you refuse Jesus, you literally do lose it all, right? But he said, if you lose your life for my sake and the Gospels, all the way up to being a radical follower of Jesus, right? I give you my whole life, Lord. You'll, you'll save it. And... The word save there is the word sozo in Greek, which is where we get the word for our sozo ministry, because sozo ministry doesn't mean, it's the word save, salvation, but it doesn't just mean go to heaven or have your sins forgiven. Salvation means restoration, healing, wholeness in every way, spirit, soul, and body, right? Wholeness. And so he said, if you give your life to Jesus, your life will be sozoed. Your life will be transformed and become what it was meant to be in wholeness, in fullness. Whew. How awesome is this, right? And if you don't give your life to Jesus out of some instinct to protect yourself and serve yourself and, you know, whatever, you're actually cut off. You're cutting yourself off from the life of Jesus that literally transforms you and, and, and saves you and heals you. Wow, wow. Amazing. Uh, Matthew 17 22 and 23, uh, sort of towards the end of Jesus' ministry, uh, it says he's with his di disciples. Uh, what I want to look at here is Jesus' attitude towards death, what, what, towards his own death specifically. Jesus knew he was going to die, didn't he? He came with an appointment with a cross. He knows how it's going to happen, basically when it's going to happen. He knows why it's going to happen. He, he came for that, right? And, uh, and so what's his attitude towards this? He says, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to his disciples, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. For starters, by one of his own disciples. And they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And, and you know, you, you can tell from reading through the gospel stories that the disciples weren't fully processing the meaning of this, right? They didn't really get it, but, they, but it made him sad anyway, you know. Uh, but Jesus plainly, matter-of-factly said, yep, they're going to they're gonna arrest me, they're going to kill me, I'm going to die. But I'll be raised. And then he said, <laughs> look, in another place, Matthew 26, 32, just shortly after this, he's kind of confirming that same idea again, that he's going to die on the cross. But then in Matthew 26, 32, he says, but after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And what this sounds like to me is, yeah, I'm going to die, but after I'm raised from the dead, uh, let's meet uh, in Galilee at the Burger King. <laughs> you know the place, right? Let's meet at the Burger King, and we'll hang out, and we'll, we'll go on from there. You get, you see, Jesus is like, this is not the big, scary, the end of everything, right? Jesus is like, no, I just, I'm just going to go through this. But then afterwards, let's, let's meet at Burger King and go on. So the, this is the attitude I believe that he wants us to have also is that death for us as a believer is just not supposed to be this big, 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 scary thing that we spend all our time trying to avoid. 
You know, like, well, I could die. Well, I could die. Well, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to play in the traffic, and I'm not going to be dumb. Okay, I want to live my full life too. I do, because I have purpose, right? But we're just not going to be afraid of it. It's already defeated. If we pass through the veil of death, we just come out on the other side. You're still who you are, right? You have eternal life, right? It's not the end at all, at all. It's like walking through a door into a different room. It may be an unpleasant, you know, time. Some, sometimes walking through that door can be an unpleasant time. Depends how, you know, how that death happens. I get that. Jesus' death was very unpleasant for him. But he also knew it's just, it's just a crossover, right? It's just something I'm going through. Afterwards, I'll meet you at the Burger King in Galilee. Okay? Right. So if you can kind of adopt that, you know, Luke uh, 23 uh, 32 and 33, there's another thing that Jesus said to somebody that really kind of gives me his perspective on death also, and what our attitude he wants us to have for this thing. So we know that when Jesus was crucified, there's two other criminals that were crucified with him, right? And it says here, there were two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So I believe that this little scenario here, uh, like many things in the Bible, is sort of a mini picture of the larger picture. And these, this represents the human race right? and the, in human history and human destiny. These two criminals represent all of us because they're guilty and we're all guilty. They're condemned to death and we're all condemned to death for our sins and our crimes. And uh, there's Jesus who became one of us, dying in the midst of us, the innocent one dying in the midst of the guilty. And he's dying for us. And this is a picture of this because there's going to be two different reactions from these criminals who are dying at his, either side of him. Amen? And that, and that goes in, in a verse, uh, you see the rest in verse 39. And one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Which, if it was a sincere thing he said, it would, it, would, it would be a whole better thing that he said, but he's saying it mocking. He's mocking, you know, oh, yeah, you think you're the savior of the world, you can't get us down from here even, right? You can't even save yourself, right? Go ahead. But the other criminal answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you're under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. So this one criminal says, we deserve to be here. Right? <laughs> we, we got ourselves here, right? So shut up, right? And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. <laughs> this represents the human race. Jesus, the innocent one, dying in the midst of us as one of us, for us. And, and some people reject and mock and someone else says, I need you. I need you. I believe in you. Remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus said, you know what Jesus said, right? Verse 43. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, when? Today, you will be with me in paradise. <sighs> that criminal, in the last hours of his life, said, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. I believe in you. And Jesus said, you just got in. <laughs> you just got in. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the kingdom. He said, today. I mean, that's good news if you're, if you're a criminal dying on a cross right now. That's really good news. Today, we'll be in paradise together. You'll be who you are. You live forever now. You just got saved. Whew. You don't have to be afraid of this thing. You know, this is Jesus saying, you know what, we're, we're on a cross together, and this is still going to be a really, really unpleasant little bit of time here. But when this is over, we're through the veil, we're into paradise, you're with me. Nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. And now, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not being flippant about Jesus' death. I'm really not. He paid the price to redeem us from sin and death. It was a big, big deal, and it cost him. It cost him dearly on the cross. I'm only saying today, 
also see the other side of this thing. He said, yeah, as soon as this is over, I'll meet you at Galilee at the Burger King, and we'll go on. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just defeating death for you. I'm just redeeming you from death. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Just don't live as a Christian trying not to die. Live for Jesus, fully engaged. Amen. This thing is not scary to us. Um, Isaiah 25, verse 6 to 8, is a prophecy uh, God gave through Isaiah about how he's going to destroy death for us. This is a prophecy given about 600 years before Jesus comes. And God said... Uh, through Isaiah, and in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces. That would be the Mount Zion, and he's kind of speaking symbolically of his work in redemption through the church. And anyway, just take my word for it. The Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, and of well-refined wines on the lees. In other words, big party forever. It's going to be a huge party, right? Okay, keep going. What are you talking about here, Lord? And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. Ah, oh, this is such an interesting prophecy. He's going to, dis there's a surface of covering cast over all the people of the earth. There's a veil that is spread over all the nations of the earth. What is that veil? What is that covering? He tells you in the next verse. He will swallow up death forever. Eliminate it, deal with it, gone. Wow. He'll swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. <laughs> wow. We read that a number of weeks back in you know, the Creation Zone series uh, from the book of Revelation. God says God will make a new heaven and a new earth, and he says he will, death will be gone forever, and he will wipe away every tear. Right? And that's the fulfillment of this prophecy. Death will be gone forever. Wow. So back in verse 7 for a moment, if you would, what's that veil? What's that covering? Well, it's death, right? It's death. And what I believe this is referring to is that, you know, death is like a veil that separates heaven and earth. And that's why heaven, heaven and earth are separated right now. And, and that's why you can't see heaven from here. That's why people don't necessarily believe in heaven. You can't see it from here. There's a veil, a covering. It's called death, right? It's a darkness. But for the believer, once you pass through that veil, you're in glory, right? You're out of this broken place, and you're in the place that was never broken. Amen? And you're going to live forever. And then you have an appointment for a new body soon after that. Amen? Yeah. So, and you're the same person you were. Right? You just pass through the veil, and you're still you, and you live forever. And it's good. So uh, I believe that, when did that veil happen? The moment Adam and Eve sinned. I really believe that, that heaven and earth were not, heaven and earth were together. There was no separation before Adam and Eve sinned, right? Even the, there was a, in the garden, there was something called the tree of life. It seemed to be a very supernatural tree. Turns out that tree shows up in the book of Revelation. It's still around. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, there was just, heaven and earth were intersected and all, you know, kind of one realm together and no problem. And then it got separated the moment Adam and Eve sin. And there's this veil. But God says, I'm going to remove the veil. I'm going to tear it up and get rid of it. And I'm going to swallow up death forever. And it'll all be back together. In the end, it'll be fixed. <sighs> Remember that phrase from verse 8. What was it, verse 8, uh, the first part of it? Yeah, he will swallow up death forever. Remember, remember that part for... Keep it in your mind for a moment. Also look at uh, Hosea 13, verse 14. This is another prophecy through uh, prophet Hosea, also 600 or so years before Jesus. God said, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. <laughs> o death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. Yeah. This is, I believe this is God saying, oh, death, I'm going to crush you, and I'm not going to change my mind about it at all. <laughs> I'm going to crush you completely and forever. 
I will ransom my people from the grave. I will redeem my people from death because I hate death. It was never meant to be. <clears throat> and I owe death. And remember that phrase too, oh death and oh grave. God says, I'm going to crush you, <laughs> and I'm not going to change my mind about it. Now, jump up to 1 Corinthians 15, please, verse 50 to 55. There we go. The Apostle Paul wrote this uh, after, shortly after Jesus did what he did. And Paul says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. This, this body is corrupted, right? This one. And, and he said, no, this body will be changed, but you'll still be you. It'll be a new body, but, but it'll be incorrupted, and you'll still be you. And you'll look about 33, and you'll look good. And <laughs> Go ahead. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Sleep is just a polite word for dying, but Paul says sleep because Christians don't really die, right? The body, the body wears out, but you go on. You go on. Um, in fact, here's, here's an interesting thought, too. I'll just interject here. It, you know, Jesus said, I came that you might have abundant life, right? As a Christian, if Jesus doesn't come back first, this body will wear out, right? It, it's going to. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll give up, it'll wear out at some point, and it'll, it'll quit. Uh, but you, Jesus said, I came that you might have abundant life. At the moment of your physical death, you have abundant life. Don't see it otherwise, because your spirit and your soul are still full of the abundant life of Jesus at the moment of your physical passing. Amen? You're still walking in abundant life. You, just, you can just smile and go. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> yeah. And then you get a new body afterwards, right? That's how he wants you to see this thing, right? It holds no power over you, right? Go ahead. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. People will come from heaven that had already physically died and people and bodies will be recreated and people that are on earth still alive, believers, they'll be caught up, right? And we'll all have immortality and be glorified, be resurrected. Go ahead. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Must and will, if you believe in Jesus. For when, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And we read that that was Isaiah, wasn't it? That was Isaiah 25, verse 8. Uh, I will swallow up death forever. You notice when Paul quotes a lot of the Old Testament things, he doesn't necessarily quote word for word, but he quotes for meaning. Right? So he said, Paul said, there it is. When, when the rapture, resurrection happens for the believer, there it is. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, no more victory for you. Nah, nah. <laughs> right? Go ahead. And 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? That is actually the quote we also read from Hosea, right? Uh, Hosea 13, 14. Where God said, you know, the, the wording was slightly different, right? God said, oh, grave, I will, I'm going to crush you, right? Oh, oh, oh death, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat you up. I'm not going to change my mind. Paul quotes it for meaning, essentially. Oh, death, you lost your sting. Ha, ha. Oh, Hades, you lost your victory. <laughs> We're redeemed forever. <laughs> uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 26, oh. Earlier in that same chapter, Paul said, now, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He bet, beat death, right? He beat it, and then he said, You can follow me if you want to. I, op I opened the door. I am the door. Follow me if you want to, and you can be raised up also. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Uh, this, is the, this is one of the other places in the New Testament where it says that death did not exist until Adam sinned. It wasn't part of the process. It wasn't a natural thing. It wasn't God didn't create it. It wasn't God's idea ever. Death literally did not exist as a thing until Adam and Eve sinned. And death came into the world because of a man. 
and it says that by man also came the resurrection. A man messed it up, and so a man had to reverse it. And God became that man, Jesus. Keep in mind, that was a permanent commitment, right? When, when, when Jesus redeemed us as a man, rose from the dead, went back to heaven 40 days later, he did not go into heaven, reach back, unzip that old human body and take off the human body and say, oh, it's good to be free from that thing. Jesus is still a man, still in a man's body forever and ever and ever and ever. That was a commitment that he made to become one of us, to save us and be our king. That's love. He became a man forever. <laughs> 22. For as in Adam all die, even so, if you're in Christ, all shall be made alive. Each one in his, in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. Meaning, any earthly kingdom, any earthly government, any earthly system that resists God, that opposes God, will get crushed. It'll be over and done. Jesus will set up his kingdom. It'll be a real kingdom with a real king. And, and uh, it'll be a kingdom of love and goodness and righteousness. Amen? Whew. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And the very last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Yeah, done and gone, destroyed, finished forever. Wow. By the end of what the Bible calls the millennial kingdom, right, death will be completely eliminated forever and ever and ever. We get delivered from it at the rapture. And we have an appointment with that um, somewhere in the next number of years or decade or so, I don't know, right? I mean, we are literally in the, in the last days. I'm not setting a date, I can't do that, right? But, uh, you know, the Bible indicates in several different places that the church age, what we call the church age, is about 2,000 years. The church age began not at Jesus' birth, it began at his resurrection. He, ra he was raised about by our calendar, if you trace it back, about 33 AD, right? Give or take a little for calendar error. Uh, so about 2,000 years, you know, 2033 is a good target date to begin to expect the Lord's return, right? Uh, how close is that? Yeah, it's getting kind of close, isn't it? Right? I mean, that's, that's my thought on the matter. Can't set a date, you know, but uh, I know the church age is about 2,000 years. So, uh, and then, uh, then there's a thousand-year kingdom millennium, but we're delivered from death at the rapture. That's done for us. But then the death is completely eliminated from creation at the end of that millennial kingdom forever and ever. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> so that, that's what I wanted to share with you today. And I guess that I, I just wanted to get deep inside of your heart and your, your awareness that what Jesus did on the cross is not just so your sins are forgiven, you go to heaven and sit on a cloud and play a harp. Right? Jesus delivered us from sin and death. So we literally live forever. You'll be who you are in a body that is young, beautiful, and indestructible. <laughs> and you'll live forever in God's love the way it was intended to be. <laughs> it's good news, huh? It's good news. Don't live in fear of death. Don't live trying not to die. Live fully engaged. Live for Jesus. Live meaningfully. Live purposefully. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, let's pray. Hmm. Can we stand together for a moment? And if you're if you're uh, not physically comfortable standing, perfectly okay. Otherwise, I'd prefer if we just engage for a few minutes or a few moments anyway. And a little background instrumental of any kind would be nice. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you that you partook of flesh and blood like us. An eternal commitment to become one of us. Redeem us from death, but also redeem us from the fear of death so that we can live.
for you, fully engaged, not a shadow of what we were meant to be, but fully noble people with purpose, with love, living without, without fear. Not just living, trying not to die, but living for you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. I pray, God, Holy Spirit, in this moment, please pour into everybody's heart and soul right now the revelation, the awareness, the power of this reality that we are delivered from death. It is not really a threat to us. It's just a, it's just a door we pass through. We continue to be us. We have eternal life. Holy Spirit, just pour that awareness into everybody. In the name of Jesus, take out. We surrender that fear. We reject that fear. Yes, in the name of Jesus, we reject that fear of death. We reject, reject the power of it. We're not going to live under it. We're not going to live trying not to die. Holy Spirit, fill us with your love, your boldness, your faith, your purpose with a passionate love for Jesus. <sighs> Minister to your people, Lord. In fact, I pray, I pray, God, that none of us here today or watching by live stream, I pray that none of us for the rest of our lives will make decisions from fear. I pray that we will not make our decisions from fear. We will be wise, yes. We will be wise, of course. We want to live our lives fully. We want to live out our lives fully. But we will not live in fear. And we, God, I pray that everybody in this church will not make any decision in their life based on any fear ever again. But they will make their decisions based on heart-to-heart -heart connection with you, God, and the awareness of your will, guiding them and flowing into them. And through your word, God, that they will live above fear as more than conquerors in Jesus Christ, overcomers in Christ, influencers, leaders, ha, people of destiny, fully engaged, living for Jesus. That's my prayer. If you agree, say amen, 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 amen. God bless you. I love you. Thanks for being here today.